I had first been introduced to it from the screenplay, from the screen, through the screenplay. Uh, Jez Butter wrote, wrote the, the corporate that she put together with Jez. And um, it was just about 30 pages in as I was starting to understand who Jennifer was in, in the adaptation that Dylan's face got imprinted on it for me. And that was, that, there was no going back at that point. And I got so involved in the story and so moved by it. Um, and there were, you know, there, there were so many things beyond just that kind of character-driven thing. There were thematic things um, about deception and its corrosive nature and things that, uh, you know, I think have only become more and more timely in, in, in a sense of what uh, deception can do to an individual or to a country. Yeah. Bill, in, in terms of we're getting the screenplay into a into a working uh, shape, in terms of the, the both kind of parallel ideas of the, of the two characters of John and Jennifer, was there a sense of kind of making sure that each of them sort of have a, uh, in some ways, a, a connection to each other and making sure that the story keeps that parallel track in some ways? Yeah, I think we always saw it as fundamentally Jennifer's story and that you know, she really has uh, such a big arc and it's kind of her slow dawning realization of the true nature of her father that creates a kind of personal crisis for her around her own identity. But the book is so rich and it spans so many years and there's so many great events and characters in it and so it, it was a challenge to adapt, you know. Uh, it wasn't really your typical indie film in terms of the kind of unity of place and simplicity of it. You know, it was a 25 year story and a peripatetic family that's moving all around from state to state and over to the West Coast. Uh, but Jez is, you know, just a terrific um, playwright and screenwriter. Uh, Sidney Pollock and I have worked with him on the movie that he actually wrote and directed, Birthday Girl. And so it was out of that relationship that I brought him the book. And, and you know, he wrote the script that really attracted Sean, which was, And Bill, what an amazing performance. Let's have a round of applause, please. <laughs> The performance, it's like a diamond. There's so many different facets to it. And there's so many different levels. What were some of the keys to her for you and kind of bringing her in? Because for so many of us, obviously, like we've had people in our lives like John, but we also feel so much like Jennifer. She's so relatable. What were some of the keys to her for you? Um, I mean, it was it was pretty simple because I got... Oh, you are? Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, <laughs> It was simple because I got to um, spend some time with her before production. So um, even though she never expected me to mimic her, just being around her and hearing her story besides the book and the script out of her own, with you know her own words, and um, I guess the biggest thing for me was that she had now present day like reconciled, accepted the fact that her father was who he was. Um, and and accepting the fact that even though she wanted her own identity, you know, separate from her past and her family, that that was always going to be a part of her. That's what created her identity, or it's a piece of her identity. Um, but I guess the biggest piece for me was that she was just so... Um, strong and always striving for the truth, something that she always wanted from her father and never got it, so she found it elsewhere in journalism, and yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Sean, uh, obviously the, the title of the film alludes to it and the, the flag imagery is there, but there's something about uh, John Bogle's character that reminds me so much of, of in this country, the, the, the sort of the theme that, that resonates for me about him is that that there's a sense of, of what this country kind of doesn't do with with uh, people who are on the fringe, people trying to find their way, and how often those people, you know, feel as if there's a sense of um, a, a sense of of that their their loss 
in their, their feeling lost, they're trying to find their way, and the country sort of kind of puts them to the side. I'm wondering if those ideals were there for you as you were thinking about the character and directing it in terms of performing it, if that aspect of, of that character being this, um, being something kind of cast aside by the American dream in some ways was, was prevalent for you. Yeah, well, I think it's a truly explosive mix when you take alienation um, and entitlement. And, you know, I, I don't know if anybody knows whose birthday flag day is, uh, but a symbol of the exploitation of alienation and entitlement, um, who we recently had living in our White House. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there, there is an empathy, I think, that has to be registered on about, you know, the alienation aspect of it, not the, um, you know, sort of misled promise of entitlement. Uh, and, and, and all of that, you know, wrapped, it, it was so central to what part, what, the, what in the narrative interested me. It's, it's in, in some ways, I mean, there's so many heartbreaking aspects to to John that when he says, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, he's, that is that is where he wants to be. It's not sort of he's not pulling a scam on himself in some ways. That is really, in some ways, uh, in watching the film now several times, an aspect of his character that he kind of feels like I could be this if I had this opportunity, if the opportunities were there, if the if the kind of the promise that the country had was extended to, to him and to people like yeah, him. Right? I mean, the best deception starts with self deception. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dylan, that kind of leads to a, a great thought here in terms of the, the way you portray Jennifer. Uh, there's a psychological uh, concept that, that I hope I do justice to, which is what called generational transference of trauma. And I, and I see in your performance the aspects of Jennifer being affected not only by her father, but by the, the forces that created him, by his societal uh, experiences. And I'm wondering if, and especially those amazing scenes of, of going through teens and 20s and we see Jennifer in, in different aspects of her life, if you kind of approach the character in some ways from a psychological point of view rather than almost a chronological point of view mm -hmm. in aging her in, 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 those, uh, in those scenes? Maybe sub subconsciously. Um, I think I especially felt that when the scene where she finds out what he actually does for work um, and, and kind of celebrating the fact that he's doing this humble work, it's real work, and um, but then also, I think as a child, to see your parents humble can also be a traumatic thing, um, especially because he's he, embarrassed about the fact that he has his job. Um, so yeah, and I think, I think I've had, I think I take on my dad's energy as a person um, so the fact that we're acting together, I think it's some real, um, you know, it's a real feeling that I have with him. We'll take some questions from the audience in just a moment. I want to ask Bill about the, about the aspects of John and Jennifer's character. What was the toughest for you to get onto the screen in some ways, to get onto the page? Uh, what was the hardest to, to really kind of transfer into the screenplay for? Well, I mean, we didn't really do a lot of, uh, extensive development work. I mean, Jez really had a take on this, and his script really captured both the humor and the pain and the pathos. A lot of the work Sean and I did really was to try to make it makeable, uh, because, you know, the marketplace for smart independent films for adults was not blossoming over the last 15 years as we were trying to make it. It was consolidating, and, you know, Sean, uh, was great at kind of identifying the essence of the story, but also wanting to open it up and leave space for more nonverbal, you know, just purely cinematic uh, images to carry the story. So he and Jez got together, you know, they collaborated on that, but it was really more kind of uh, the script reflecting Sean's vision of the overall tone and breadth of the movie. And I think the characterizations were, were pretty much there. <coughs> If anyone has a question, definitely put your hand up and put it up high if I can ask someone who's putting up that's right in our face. I'm going to first roll right here and then I'll work my way back. Yes, sir. Uh, my question's for Sean, but Dylan, if you have any input as well, feel free. Um, I'm just wondering, Sean, you said that when you found the script, 
you saw Dylan in the role. Um, do you also see yourself and right away like yourself with you both as director and actor and her in the main role? I just find that dynamic to be very fascinating. Yeah, no, I didn't automatically see myself or not see myself in it. What I knew until I didn't know it, which was 30 days from the first day of shooting, was that I was not going to direct it and act in it. Um, and so there were very, the, on the film's journey, there were times where it would have been Dylan and I acting in it with another director, and then, and then finally it was going to be her and another actor, me directing. And then for family reasons, that actor fell out very last minute. And, I, and I'm, I would, which was devastating because you're looking at a 17 and a half hour day job as it is, uh, directing and, and very, you know, when you're scrambling with the kind of budget that we had, to, you, you really need all the kind of prep minutes you can get and you don't get that many. But I'm so glad it happened because what a great opportunity working with her, but in terms of Dylan, it was that I had had 27 years at that point, I guess, uh, of experience around that face that never told you what it was thinking, but was always, there was such a pure intelligence and pure intuitiveness that I just thought uh, a camera would, would like, and my camera, I mean, ultimately an audience, is allowed to explore what's being thought and felt by somebody who's really thinking and feeling it and not telling them what to think about it. And that's what every, you want every actor to aspire to. Uh, and she has it in just such a solid, moving way to, to, to me. just touched my personal life, my core. And I love that you brought humanity to the to John because I wish he was my dad. I mean, there was such joy in that and then such, you know, angst. And I love your character, Dylan, as well as, you know, the disappointment, but yet that that looking up and admiring and so wanting your dad there. And, Dad's love. Thank you so much. It was a ride and a cry at the end. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right here in the head, right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just curious about the script. So the evolution from a book. How many voices in the process of in getting? The process of yeah, I think as Bill, yeah. as Bill said, you know, when you, when you hire a writer like Jess, yeah. um, you, 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 you're going to let there be one voice. And then I'm sure before I came into the game, before we, we got involved, I'm sure, you know, Jess was open to hearing thoughts that Bill had. But well, once, you know, I think the, the best producers um, are great encouragers of the people that they go to to do things. and. Um, and I know that, you know, when Bill and I, what, what then happens, because I, I think that if you haven't written something yourself as a director, because I've done both, I've done it, original screenplays, I've done adapted screenplays that I wrote, and I've done screenplays other people wrote. And in the third category in particular, you still have to make it yours. And the process on this one, because the script was so beautifully written, uh, was me kind of going through all these beautifully written scenes and screen directions and saying, what part of this can I tailor to the kind of movie making that I like, which does become somewhat dependent on song and on narration. And so I would cut out I did, rather than rewriting, I, I revised by paring down, taking this essence of what Jez's now edited scenes were, and finding images, and then going to great songwriters and saying, you know, and, and this was a, 
a daily kind of conversation with Bill where it, as soon as I come up with cuts, I bounce it off of him. And what do you, you know, and we would go back and forth on stuff. So um, as many voices as Jez wanted and as many voices as I wanted because our producers uh, were very willing to stay out of the way and trust us. One thing I just want to add, you know, because when you're dealing with true stories and real people and people are alive especially, you kind of have an extra responsibility. And that doesn't mean you're making a documentary of their life. You know, you, your responsibility is to the truth and you're using all the devices of storytelling to get to the truth that is gonna touch you guys. And Sean was just remarkable at kind of walking that, you know, balancing act with Jennifer Vogel. He really made her a, a true partner. She read every draft of the script. Uh, she came out to LA and saw cuts of the film. And she very much felt honored that she had a seat at the table. And we took, you know, what she had to say very seriously. At the same time, it was kind of a give and take, you know, where there was a certain amount of dramatic license that was necessary. Uh, you know, both in omissions, I mean, Jennifer has a sister who's not, you know, was never in the script and not in the movie. And, you know, we had to make sure that everybody in the family felt okay about that. Um, and, you know, she was with us in Cannes and, you know, has just been, you know, tremendous partner. In, in well, actually, Jennifer's sister is in the movie in the sense that yes. she has, through her DNA, the sketching hand of her father, and so she did all the I sketches. Saw that. I said oh. something Vogel yeah. was Liz, Liz Vogel. Liz Vogel, yeah. Let me show you the middle. Liz, and see you guys Liz. as well. So everybody had up. There's one uh, right in the middle there with the black mask. Yes. Hey, oh, me? Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Um, I was wondering, Mr. Penn, about the decision to uh, shoot on film because uh, it's such a specifically amazing look, and mm -hmm. especially seeing it this close. I uh, wonder if it was motivated by the source material, if it's something you just. Uh, love shooting that way for all of your films? As I get older, I more fully acknowledge what I do and don't trust, and I don't trust digital photography. Uh, you, you can see there's been brilliant movies made brilliantly digitally, um, and you could take a still from one of those movies and maybe I might be compelled, but a synthetic grain um, does not pass time in an honest way. And the, the, the grain, and in this case, I, I think in part because I finally got kind of appalled to the plasticine things that were, that are, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't biorhythmically hitting me in movie theaters with digital. I had made one movie digitally and regret as a director and regretted it because I didn't ever trust it. Uh, I just didn't trust what I was seeing and feeling. Um, and then with this story, I just wanted to go to that which I trusted most. And what I trusted most was um, from a time in my life as an audience of movies, that kind of early 70s period, which is just as I was kind of coming into the age of being a, a, a fan of movies in a serious way. It's an amazing time for that to happen. Um, and there's some kind of harkening to what that looked like. And so we decided to shoot on 16 millimeter, uh, this whole movie and the eight millimeter. Um, and, uh, and I'm really glad we did. I, I, and Danny Motor, the cinematographer, uh, was so willing to go down that road with us and, and just did beautiful work, I think. Look at this one, so beautiful and so intimate in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Right there, right in the middle of that hand up, yes. The, uh, the soundtrack's incredible. Uh, you've collaborated with Eddie Vedder before, but now you've got Glenn Hansard and, and Cap Power involved and, and Ed's daughter, Olivia. What was, what was that like creating the soundtrack? You know, on, on Into the Wild with Ed, um, we, we, my editor, Jay Cassidy, and I, my editor on Into the Wild, Jay Cassidy, and I, uh, with, um, we had, we were cutting and cutting and, and, and putting temp pieces in, and then waiting for files from Seattle. And each time one of those files came, it was just such a gift, what, what, what he did for that. 
And I think that what Ed and I found is that we have a similar, we're moved by very similar things, but he has a talent I don't have to express what we're moved by in song. And, and, and to do it in the voice I wish I could, if, if I could sing as an American filmmaker who saw the movies I make, that's the voice that I would sing with. And so Ed started, and, and Ed and Glenn were very close, and, and, and uh, so he brought Glenn in, they did some sessions, but it was very clear to me that, unlike Into the Wild, that this was principally a female story, and that it, I needed a female voice do dominating the track. And I listened to every great and near great uh, that we've heard of and not heard of, and I couldn't find harmony with what I thought was Dylan's emotional expression. So then we did this novel thing. We asked Dylan, who do you think should? Uh, and she said, Cat Power, who I had not heard of. But Ed had worked with her. And then I listened to Cat Power, and I think I was about halfway into song one. And I said, this is who we want to get. And so Ed reached out. But Eddie cured, kind of curated all that. And then the gifts of Olivia's voice at the end um, that's his 16-year-old daughter singing those end, two end title songs. Uh, those were those were gifts that came later in the process, and uh, they just found their way naturally in the picture. So we have time for just one more over here on the left hand side. First hand I saw one up. Yes. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is Claude, and one is Dylan. Um, Dylan, you The, uh, on the flag day answer, oh, that, that the title should be as significant uh, as it is or isn't to any one of you. <laughs> you know, I think there, 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 there's there's a lot to uh, the character of John Vogel is driven by poisons that have gotten into the ink of our flag and that we're all looking to get out of it. Um, yeah. Not any one individual, but uh, certain coincidences happen. <laughs> well, for me, the most difficult scenes were when I was asking Dylan to go into painful places. Um, but, uh, and, and, Coming redundant now, but my joke about this was I felt like calling child protective services on this <laughs> a few times. But then I saw how much she was game to go there. And uh, yeah, yeah, the most difficult was just, you know, seeing your daughter cry. Yeah. <laughs> she cried a lot here. <laughs> I think for me it's funny because I think the most difficult scenes were this. Um, need to be uh, joyous in maybe two out of all the scenes that I did. Um, because it was so not, I don't know, to fake joy is really difficult for me. I think I can always tap into like, the horrific things I think about to promote you know, pain or to cry. Um, but uh, I don't know if, if this is difficult, but the, the scene where I see John kill himself on live TV um, was actually the first time I saw that footage. Um, and it was one of the few times that I really felt like I was watching my dad, mm. not John. Um, and it was interesting because I had been on set that day, but I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen him actually look into the camera and shoot himself in the head. So that uh, first take was like my real reaction. Um, and then it's just funny that I was crying watching him die, and he was crying watching me watch him. <laughs> <laughs>
the energy on the on the film is obviously so strong for, for all of you. And I, but I would uh, feel really strong to wrap up by maybe asking, because it's a father daughter story, what did each of you learn about the other's artistic process, maybe their you know creative instincts, anything like that that maybe you hadn't seen before? Um, Sean, we'll start with you. Is um, is thinking on on looking at Dylan's creative instincts and her and her art. What did you learn about her on this film that you hadn't known before? I think that because of all that we get conditioned by um, in film and life, uh, we that you really have to make an effort in anything creative to keep you know saying, but what do I think? You know, and and, and so very much like what I felt about making it on film instead of digitally. I think that what I realized was at the heart of my supreme confidence that Dylan could do this thing, was that there's no contrivance in her. And that there are so many times actors, you know, good actors, impressive actors, Will, there's a contrivance where you see, oh, they read this scene, and I know that where this idea comes from. It comes from all of us all the time in our conditioning, and not from anything kind of just pure. And uh, she has that in, a, in, in such a disarming way. Um, did I answer your question? You sure did. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about for your dad? What, what did you learn about his process? I don't know if I learned anything new, um, but working, I mean, obviously this is the first time we've worked in a professional environment, and I was extremely hesitant to work with him, period, because you never know, in general, movie making, any kind of business, working with family can be disastrous or it can be great. Fortunately, it was great working with him for me, but um, I was, I guess I was surprised that he was so willing to collaborate. I think. That was made easier because we were really on the same page in terms of my choices for Jennifer's character. Um, but I think it's, I really want to direct. That's really where my passion lies in writing. And, and if I ever were to do a true story, I think watching him as a director really include Jennifer because it's her story was a huge, like that was a big tip that I will always take with me. Um, and oh, and I think music, especially in mean, all of his films, but this and It's a Wild is another character, which I think is so important because, you know, yeah. the soundtrack is everything to me. Yeah. yeah, well, this film is so great. I think all of us have had an amazing experience watching and listening to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to ask everyone just for COVID reasons to maybe save your seats for a couple of seconds as we ask out, out the door. But thank you so much, and let's have a round of applause.